Okay, we're going to get started. Um, that is a hard light. I don't know if they can, they're going to keep it down a little bit, but I guess they need the light for the um, video. Um, I'm Karen Sue Tausig. I am the chair of the anthropology department. I want to welcome you to the 2017 Daphne Berdahl Memorial Lecture. The lecture was established in 2007 to celebrate the life and work of Daphne Berdahl. Um, Daphne was a widely recognized scholar for her work on borders and borderlands, consumption and citizenship, and the politics of memory, nostalgia, and post-socialist transitions. We want to thank the Berdahl family for their gifts supporting the lectureship and also for establishing the Daphne Berdahl Graduate Student Fellowship, which has now provided support for five graduate students at crucial stages of their PhD research. It's truly a pleasure to welcome Professor Marilyn Strathern to the University of Minnesota. Professor Strathern is Emeritus Professor of Social Anthropology, University of Cambridge. She is preeminent as a social anthropologist whose work has focused on Papua New Guinea in Melanesia and the United Kingdom. She has been described as contemporary anthropology's sharpest and most original mind. Of course, she is much more than a mind. Um, Professor Strathern's work is particularly distinctive for its rich interweaving of extensive ethnographic fieldwork and theoretical rigor and innovation. Her research in Papua New Guinea began about 50 years ago, focusing on, among other topics, issues of gender and exchange. Many of us who read Professor Strathern's work likely first encountered it in her sophisticated critique of anthropological theories of society and gender relations in The Gender of the Gift, published in 1988. In the UK, her research has focused on kinship, reproductive technologies, bioethics, audit culture, and cross-cultural concepts of intellectual property. Her 1992 collection of essays, collections of essays, um, The First After Nature, based on her Lewis Henry Morgan lectures at the University of Rochester, and the second, Reproducing the Future, Anthropology, Kinship, and the New Reproductive Technologies, um, which were particularly influential to me and my research. Um, but this work, for example, like much of her work, explore persons and things in relation to property, substance, and effect. Projects over the last 25 years are reflected in publications on reproductive technologies and intellectual and cultural property rights. Her critique of good practice, or what in the US is usually rendered as best practice, has been the umbrella under which she has written about audit, accountability, and interdisciplinarity, in which she brings anthropological insights to the study of management practices in and beyond the academy. Some of these themes are brought together in her 2005 book, Kinship, Law, and the Unexpected. Papua New Guinea is never far from her concerns, the most recent visit to Mount Hagen being in 2015. Professor Strathern has been the recipient of numerous honors and distinct distinctions from institutions around the world. Indeed, it would be impossible to review all of these if we wanted to hear her actually give her talk. But to give a sense, she has been a museum curator, a research fellow, and a college fellow at Girton College at Cambridge University. She held the post of William Wise Professor of Social Anthropology until her retirement in 2008. In 1998, she was elected mistress of her Cambridge alma mater, um, Girton College. She is a fellow of the British Academy, foreign honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the first recipient in, in recent times of the American Viking Fund Medal for Outstanding Intellectual Leadership. She holds the Huxley Memorial Medal from the Royal Anthropological Institute for Lifetime Achievement and Honorary Life President of the Association of Social Anthropologists. In 2001, Professor Strathern was made Dame Commander of the British Empire for Services to so Social Anthropology. Professor Strathern ha also has brought her anthropological expertise to the world beyond the academy in social policy and practice. She served as a member of the Nuffield Council on Bioethics and chaired one of its working groups, reporting on the donation of human body material for medicine and research. Today, stimulated by Daphne Berdahl's account of an East German village being precipitated into a new world, Professor Strathern is going to talk to us about time, transitions, and future imaginings. Please join me in welcoming Professor Strathern. Uh, 
Professor Tausig, ladies and gentlemen, and colleagues. It's a huge pleasure to be here at Minnesota, and even more so an honor to be giving this lecture in memory of Daphne Berdal. I thank you all for the opportunity, and not least the Berdal scholars, and not least, the opportunity to consider something of the work of this remarkable anthropologist. Although much of what I shall be talking about couldn't be more distant in time and space from the focus of Berdal's ethnographic studies, it's been inspiring to return to her monograph where the world ended. It was a stroke of genius to have gone so shortly after the fall of the Berlin Wall, not to the heartland of the former East Germany, but to one of its border villages, Keller, on the very edge of the country. Hidden in a restricted zone, it must have felt remote. And the phrase with which Badal evokes its spatial extremity carries a temporal resonance as well. The villagers' world was to end abruptly. A way of life changed overnight. Much has, of course, been written since, but what she deftly captured in the years immediately after were the parallel worlds that people on either side of the former border continued to imagine for one another. Post-socialist, perhaps the people of Keller now felt remote in a different way. You already know the direction that her interests took, not notably with the phenomenon of nostalgia that sprang up not so long after. People talked of the presentation of the of the preservation of GDR everyday life. GDR food became traditional and there were museum exhibits of GDR culture. Her famous essay on nostalgie pinpointed the fact that this was not nostalgia for something long gone, but for the present, a familiar world, but one that could now only be made present in the idiom of historicization. It was her hallmark that Badal saw its complexity, people putting all kinds of things into the past in order to reappropriate them as the object of memory and thus give these East German things something of a future. They were being retemporalized in multiple ways, practices of recuperation, she called them. What was being recuperated was that very familiarity with that which had been literally displaced by the turn of events. At the end of the lecture, I shall be talking about a recuperation of sorts, although it was one that took less the form of recreating signs of prior ways of being than what I believe was an attempt to recapture the moment of transition itself. It was the cut or break that was being reinvented. However, I do not jump there immediately. Rather, I want to take a route that will allow me to show that there's some significance to this difference and, in fact, change my glasses because that will help me no end. <laughs> uh, that wasn't scripted. <clears throat> uh, we shall be moving to a place, Papua New Guinea, whose inhabitants have been known to refer to their whole country as the last place. The last place, they say, in the world implied, the furthest you can go, a phrase they may also use of home settlements that are hidden. Somewhat sardonically, people use this to draw attention to how far they are these days from the sources of power that matter. Colonization dislodged their own sense of being at the center of things. What is interesting about Papua New Guinea is that it is a country where, like socialism in East Germany, for many people, colonialism came and went in a lifetime. Post-colonial, people have a new sense of their remoteness. First, however, we shall stay in East Germany, a couple of decades on from Berdal's original fieldwork. I refer to an ethnographic study of what, after years of boom and growth, is now supposed to be Germany's fastest shrinking city, Heuswerder. Its residents also have to deal with a further overturn of events, deindustrialization. Following Daphne Berdal, the ethnographer in question, Felix Ringel, considers Ostalgie as expressing otherwise denied and silenced concerns with the present, and even more than that, 
a longing for the time when there was a future. He cites her argument that it was a distinctive feature of the socialist past that it continued to provide a rhetorical force for imagining a different future from the post-socialist present. The future, he adds, re-enters the stage of shared concerns through contemporary problems of deindustrialization and globalization. The illumination that Ringel sees in Bedal's work couldn't be more different from all those studies that focus on the impact of the past on the present. However, this isn't a quarrel with history as such. Rather, it's a quarrel with the anthropological concept of culture. Finding the connotations of culture too mired in the evocation of an identifiable moment, pinned down and therefore already in the past tense, he seeks another approach to, to current predicaments. And he says, I echo my informant's surprise about situations in which objects take on unexpected temporal existence. Unpredictability, indeterminacy, heterogeneous temporal relations, these are the features that he sees in the way the residents of this city deal with the post-industrial, post-socialist decay all around them. Yet if we take seriously the present that people find themselves in, he argues, we can also start inquiring about the futures they envisage attending to relations as they exist in the present uncovers a multiplicity of temporal references. Ringel's proposition that for the anthropologist to substitute for the perspective from the past that of the future boils down to following informants' own strategy for dealing with the changes at hand. And he says, since rhythms can be disturbed, houses unexpectedly demolished, and social relations dissolved, it is the work that goes into upholding certain temporal structures, rhythms, and endurances that should catch our attention. Now, Ringel singles out an account from, from a Melanesianist, Will Rolison, and my apologies for introducing another name so quickly. For Rolison voices a similar objection to the concept of culture, and with a similar plea that anthropologists should attend to people's futures as the very horizon of their present, making the ethnographic reference point current aspirations and imaginings. So while he's not uninterested in the instituted modes by which people act, culture in a weak sense, Rolison argues that anthropologists create problems for themselves by making culture their principal reference point, culture in a strong sense. Revealing apparently innovative action to be versions of cultural tradition can get us only so far, he argues, because they will simply index the culture from which they come. The future more surely offers insight into people's stance towards the world. This is shown clearly in the actions of a mid-20th century millenarianist, Bulliger, who lived during the Second World War on one of Papua New Guinea's offshore islands a location which at one point the occupying Australian administration temporarily abandoned before the enemy. Bulliger prophesied that once all the colonists had been killed, whites would become black and the blacks white. In fact, Bulliger put himself into the position of imagining himself as white and acting as such. Rollison draws an instructive lesson from this. Anthropologists have to transcend cultural interpretation, for to make that the core of analysis would be to ignore what Bulliger was doing, acting or trying to act as someone other than himself. And I quote, while some of the terms on which this action might be comprehensible can be drawn from a cultural tradition, it's clear that the form of the past is inadequate to account for how he acted. There's a conflict between the backwards prospecting of anthropological interpretation and the forward impetus of the sense of that act. And Bulliger's own interest, uh, Rolison surmises, was in self-transformation. But this might give us pause. If there is something about the ordinary language conception of culture and the past that gets in the way of anthropological analysis, then don't they, too, need explaining? For Ringel and Rollison, both object 
to an anthropological propensity to find culture in the past, as in the English language connotation of custom as past tradition, and as we heard as an idiom from Bedal's East Germans who talked of GDR culture and tradition. These concepts clearly entail something of a disposition towards time and the making of time. So rather than just discarding them, let's make this nexus of notions interesting too. I mean the nexus including culture, the past, tradition. If it gets in the way of other things, it's pointing to its own contours and limits. More pertinently, what kind of present does it summon? And this is the question that carries me into Melanesia. And I shall be coming back um, to that nexus. Think of that phrase, last place, again. When Papua New Guinea Highlanders talk thus of their own village, like Bulliga, they must be taking a perspective from afar, from another point of view. For one man, the perspective was clearly that of the metropolis. He implied that the area formerly a centre of activity was now remote from new centres of power. And he was also complaining about government neglect and lack of local opportunities. The switch of perspectives by which a rural villager takes a metropolitan view can also offer a view from the future. Persons are, in a sense, already occupying a future position from which they are at the moment excluded. Now, there was an apparent resonance with the words of one of the gold prospectors who first entered the highlands. He referred to it as the land that time forgot. A similar sentiment to that of last place, except that here no one is switching perspectives. The explorer was from a world where, through time, civilization had evolved and modernity come to fruition, and he embodied it. He was bringing it with him, encountering a culture that his advent now put into the past. It was in the 1930s when the first Australian patrols entered the Mount Hagen area in the Highlands. Administrative development was interrupted by the Second World War. However, Kiaps, and I'm going to have to use this um, pigeon phrase, there's no better, it, it comes from the English captain and refers to patrol officers uh, and administrative uh, officers. The Kiaps re-established control immediately afterwards, not least through embarking on development projects. By the early 1960s, people were familiar with cash cropping, medical services, and local government taxes, and it's of this time that I largely speak. Their present then was full of many new things, the things of now as opposed to those of before, and especially in the mouths of local dignitaries or big men, a significant marker of now was law. The term law, as it circulated in its pigeon approximation, was understood to cover specific rules like village hygiene, the kind of peaceable conduct that made someone a man of law, and I quote from Mahagana in the 1960s, I was a fighting man, but now I'm old. You're all new men here, and a good law has come up. And a way of life that had transformed everything. Another quotation, white men have come, law has come, and the key up shows us the road to business. However, the implicit contrasts were not simply with ancestral practices. The term also discriminated between more recent temporal horizons, as followed the time of the first government appointees. And I quote again, they were strong and the Kiap told them to beat people, but now law has come up and we can't do this, and also entailed expectations of new law to come. When law finally comes and our children are all at school, we shall be ruined for what will happen when law comes and we have to buy everything with money. Indeed. With what seemed a remarkable degree of accord, Hagen people had, by the 1960s, endorsed the message of the Kiaps. Indeed, colonisation would have had a much rougher passage had there not been a general acceptance of Kiap law, which accompanied a recognition that a new time had arrived. Across Papua New Guinea, 
local men were appointed to keep order, also translated as law. However, remarkable in the Hagen case was the speed with which men seemingly assisted the process of pacification by moving into the position of dispute settlers. Just as Kiops on patrol would act as magistrates, such men held what they also called courts. With considerable enthusiasm, people took their grievances to such unofficial courts, turned up as witnesses, and so forth. The dispute settlers regarded themselves as part of the judicial system and, above all, spoke of the new law that had come with the Australians. Now, the imitation of whites, as Bulliger's action might be called, is widely reported of first contact situations. What was copied from the whites was both their body postures and etiquette and their bureaucratic structures. The latter is true also of Hagen. But here one is struck by the apparent accord that sustained the peace for many years, despite or possibly even because of the imaginative ferocity with which some appointed headmen initially meted out punishments. Imitation was, we might say, through modes of personal action that demonstrated the capacity for drawing power to oneself. Not having at their disposal the sanctions of the official judicial system, Hagen dispute settlers drew on already existing practices, notably compensation for injury. It would seem that the administration's message had gone home. Law captured a general sense that a new time had arrived or was on its way, so that one could speak of cash cropping, and the main, the main cash crop was uh, coffee, as following the law of business. The Kiop's explicit vision for the future embraced roads, hospitals, schools, and so forth, and in the 1960s, you could see what they meant in, in the form of trade stores cropping up along the roads which local, on which locals labored one day a week. It was a promissory horizon full of aspirations that colonizers and colonized alike seemed to share. Hard to believe now, but in that present, the promises made no mention of Papua New Guinea's independence. It was to come all of a sudden, 10 years later, in 1975. In the mid-1960s, Kiap said such a prospect was 100 years away. So much had to be done in terms of education, instilling proper practices, introducing economic goals and such. Trade stores built with corrugated iron were just the beginnings. In this context, we might understand the official reaction to those unofficial courts. In official eyes, it was inconceivable to regard the dispute settlers as part of the, ju the judicial system. Justice was what the Kiaps dispensed on their patrols, and they stressed the illegality of the dispute settlers' courts. A political education talk broadcast over Hagen Radio in 1970 was explicit. We can't take the law into our own hands. More benignly, the unofficial courts were tolerated as vehicles for dealing with minor conflicts, while major issues such as homicide would automatically go to the official courts. In the government view, Papua New Guineans were still at a very simple stage in their unfolding progress. Hence, one had to urge them on and talk about development. And above all, there could be no return to the past that was not a reversion, a reversion to savagery that would be turning their backs on the future. So where did Hagen enthusiasm for the law come from? The Australians could envisage what was ahead, orderly classrooms, effective hospitals, commercial plantations. But this couldn't have been on the Hagen horizon. What evidently loomed large in the Hagen present was the power the Kiaps dispensed, including the effectiveness of their punishments. This power was a particular challenge for competitively minded big men. What the Kiaps saw as people taking law into their own hands the dispute settlers saw as forging direct links with the official system, or rather with its embodiment in the persons of patrol officers and magistrates, person to person. Dispute settlers translated their mandate as a chain of command. They claimed they had been told by this or that key up 
to hear courts. For them, the new time did not just happen, it had to be made, which is what they supposed they and the Kiaps were doing together. Enthusiasm dissolved somewhat in the 1970s. Major confrontations erupted into violence with episodes of all-out war. In part, conflicts now leading to war were an outcome of the expansion of regional horizons through unaccustomed coalitions of groups into administrative units or the inadvertent homicides of motor, motor traffic, encouraged by the amount of cash in the area and spectacular prospects of huge compensation payments. Needless to say, the government and the growing urban elite regarded warfare as tribal fighting and reversion to a traditional past. Hagenus, however, saw the resumption of warfare springing from growing unrest over the official courts. Disappointingly, in their dealings with homicide, judges appeared to attend to petty issues such as who dealt this or that blow, bypassing the crucial political implications of responsibility for particular actions. The new law had failed in that respect to bring what it promised. What are we to make of that initial, uh, initial accord or agreement then when people enthusiastically tried out the law, agree, agreeing to be pacified to see what law would bring? And what do, what do we make of the very different perceptions of the judicial system, Australian and Hagen? We can understand these different perceptions as a clash of cultures, except that the encounters that took place did not just contain many accommodations, they also generated seemingly mutual aspirations for prosperity. There was hardly an overt clash. For all the violence that followed, there was no explicit resistance to the colonial government as such. Yet we witness a divergence. Where the Kiaps thought the dispute settlers were usurping the law, the latter thought they were following it. And when Hagnes did indeed take law into their own hands, bypassing the official courts through fighting, Kiap saw a reversion to primitive custom. Now, this could be taken as an instance of cultures always being mixed bags of diverse possibilities. Some things clash and some things don't, a conclusion similar to one long voiced by the Papua New Guinea judiciary. Dealing with customary law is a matter of deciding which customs are suitable for a modern legal system and which are not. But suppose we were as interested in the mutual understandings as well as the misunderstandings. Can we, in this case, account for the accord as well as for the disruption of it? I think we can, provided we see that apparent similarities as well as differences of the outcome, uh, can, can be the outcome of a deep divergence. And in many respects, I think the divergence was simply too radical to articulate. Now, one route to approaching this is to ask what kind of present these people were then in. Taking the vantage point of both the Australians and Hageners acting from the horizon of the present, I suggest that their presentism implied two very different approaches to change and the sequencing of events, and I take each in turn. The Kiaps, the Australian administrative officers, seem to have been acting out some specific assumptions about the flow of time. And there are echoes here of the East German material. In Ringel's East German city, Hoyswerder, anything can change. One way people deal with unpredictability lies in the idea that they've been living through successive epochs and could do so again not far behind all the smaller untoward events that shake up the contours of the present horizon, lie the upheavals of larger epochal changes, notably deindustrialization and the vanishing of socialism, veritable revolutions, um, that's my term, not uh, Hringel's. By diverting change along new paths, revolutions are at once interruptions in the ever-changing flow of events and enhanced moments of them. Indeed, I would see such moments registered as radical, catastrophic, or whatever, being precipitated by assumptions about change that have been typified 
as evolutionary. And this is not quite the paradox it seems. Insofar as ideas of change entail an ever-flowing progression from past to present, every temporal horizon is an accumulation of non-repeatable moments. The past is from where the present has come and is kept in its place behind it. Revolutions redefine the course of future, of future events, but do not compromise that inexorable forward movement. In fact, they draw attention to it. The first Kiops must have thought they were revolutionaries. Of course, that wasn't their language. The officers, by contrast with the gold prospectors, might have said that they were on a mission of modernization. Nonetheless, the Australians brought technical marvels with them, including guns, radios, and even, and this is Hagen in 1933, a gramophone, for those who might know what that is. And it's hard to avoid the conclusion that they were showing these off as the achievements that had brought them to a particular present. At the least, they expected such things would be greeted with amazement. And, but of course, the locals didn't appreciate the long history of technical development that lay behind the present, the evolution of civilization itself. But they may readily have seeded that a new time had come. Yet when these Papua New Guineans adapted the pigeon phrase time, what did they connote by it? A sense of moment or epoch, certainly, but time as an enveloping forward-flowing force that I wonder about. As David Lipset has said of Papua New Guinea, but drawing on classical anthropological literature, time was perceived in terms of local space activities and relationships. The literature also gives an alternative model to the evolutionary view of change, namely one that is episodic. Here change takes the form of a radical transition or episode that divides the present from past. What is at issue in episodic presentism, or at least in Papua New Guinea, is not so much a sequencing of events in time as the effect of people's actions upon one another. And I shall return to this. So suppose time were not ever flowing. Suppose past and present were cut off from each other. For a moment, such an instituting break seems to recall the revolutionary. However, either side of the boundary between past and present, things are changed less. Steady states only ruptured by catastrophic events. Which forms of life are attributed to now or which to then is a matter of emphasis, but each has its own character. It's not that there's no change at all, but that when it happens, just like Papua New Guinea's independence, change takes the form of an abrupt break. It's total, drastic, and radical, and I'm quoting here. But things may change again. Thus, the division between before and after the arrival of white Australians was a division that also applied to earlier breaks between present ways of doing things and how people existed before those came into being. Indeed, the then, now, before, after paradigm can be repeated on any scale. There is no onward flow of time that means the past is part of the present's history. And this, of course, leaves a question mark over the idea of a future. If the past is radically cut off, does it even make sense to talk of a future? An episodic present implies that how we are now entails everything about ourselves that exists now. Yet, as has been pointed out, an analytical emphasis on the radical cut between epochs fails to account for the fact that people may understand themselves as at once existing in an entirely different epoch, yet carry on with their lives much as before. And this applies particularly to millenarian movements. And here is one answer to how the future may be imagined as another break. It, too, will be a break with the present. Concomitantly, that break may be anticipated, in which case the promise of the future may, in a sense, have already changed everything in the present. Thus, people can undergo periods of intense activity, working to bring a millennial promise about, while in between, ordinary life proceeds as usual. 
This is not contradictory. In English parlance, ordinary life sounds like continuity rather than change. But here the point is that the incisive change, the new horizon of future promise, is already in place. And the phrase um, everyday millenarianism captures this routinization of radical breaks as a part of life. In this logic, in this episodic logic, the government's old, new, before, after exhortations will have seemed eminently familiar to a 1960s Hagener. The exhortations pointed to a radical change as at once already in place and as a change yet to come about. Here, Kiaps, Hagen men and women, and the anthropologist with analytical interests at heart can all concur. What had already changed was the horizon of present possibilities. In truth, a sense of catechismic change did not need to rest on a totalized image of a world new in every aspect. Change was evident in those aspects of the present day that seemed crucial diagnostics of the new time. Uh, the, the invention of marriage, for example, uh, uh, was something that uh, was often uh, uh, spoken about as um, arriving uh, in, into a particular social milieu. The millenarianist Bulliger took the crux to be an eventual reversal of black-white relations. In the Highlands, Hagen dispute settlers saw new grounds for competition as well as new possibilities for wealth, similarly transforming their persons in terms of the power that they could summon. But what have I surmised here? The Kiaps of the 1960s living in an evolutionary present, Hageners in an episodic present, yet they seem to have concurred in many things. So am I just dramatizing the difference? A diagnostic might be framed in terms of a further question. Where for each is the future? Do we arrive at the same answer in both cases? The Australians were, I think, acting out views not dissimilar from those found in Ringel's Heusferde, where people try to ensure that the forms of living they value in the present will endure into the future. This also includes what they see as coming from the past, although the future is not ob it's obviously not itself the past. So the nexus of notions that bundles together the past, tradition, culture, implies that what is in the past can only be brought into the present in a historicized form, given a future thereby, um, as of course with GDR signs of, every, of their everyday life. Quite crucially, people's idea of the future carry the signature of time's passage. Although to very different ends, the Kiaps were also concerned with time's passage, notably in terms of the growth and development that had to occur before Papua New Guinea was anywhere near independence. After the first abrupt encounter, things could only proceed incrementally. Time had to elapse before institutions matured. For the present, all they could do was plant the seeds for the future, keeping up a forward momentum or else people would be propelled backwards into primitivism. Past traditions were strangers in the new present and had to be controlled. For Hageners, to the contrary, one might say that the past can sometimes be exactly where the future is, at least insofar as the regenerative successes of the past can be drawn into the present, thus comprising moments to which one can return, and perhaps I should explain that. I've hinted that if it's useful to conceive of a Hagen presentism, it's imagined as relations between persons. The horizon that people are recovering is their ancestors present with their, the ancestors' own future orientation, which present people embody. In other words, people existing today exist as the offshoots of that previous promise and they bring that potential into their present, so they too will be the regenerators of a new future. There are no seeds here. For these horticulturalists, rather, the replacement of one generation of root crops by another implies, for example, 
that a generative or parental fragment of a yam or taro that is pushed into the ground is replaced by the yam or taro that grows in its stead, dug out from the ground at harvest, fully formed. The generative idiom is not of waiting for seeds to grow into plants, but of cutting the fragment from a mature root that will eventually emerge in the form of its progeny. The cutting is lifted out as another mature root. As some Papua New Guineans who focus on yams have it, the yam child in the ground is also the yam spirit of the root's ancestor, its parent's parent. Crucially, to keep with these food crops, plants do not grow by themselves. We're talking about the actions people take in cultivation and care alongside ritual attention to plant beings. People's efforts can be described as striving to bring about new presence as one harvest replaces another. The affirmation of that possibility lies in the break or cut between previous, between previous old and present new acts. And if what is being recalled or anticipated are the actions of persons, it also seems that relations of cause and effect are not being temporalized, or at least not in an evolutionary mode as the inevitable outcome of a sequence in time. Rather, cause and effect inhere in what people do to one another. It's a matter of how actions will in the future have turned out to bear on other actions. Provoking or eliciting such reactions is, about, is perhaps tantamount to a temporalization in an episodic mood. But of course, we can spin any number of, con of connections. Let me turn to one of today's presents that may be illuminated by a contrast between evolutionary and episodic change. It will bring us back to that nexus of the past tradition and culture which I would now locate specifically in an evolutionary type of present. You'll recall Daphne Badal's argument about recuperation. What was being recuperated by the former East German villagers were all those things that spoke of how people lived but had now been literally displaced by the turn of events. I said I'd be talking about a recuperation of a sort although it was one that took less the form of recreating signs of a former life than what I believe was an attempt to recapture a moment of transition itself. What was being reinvented was the very cut or break. In 2010, the Constitutional and Law Reform Commission of Papua New Guinea reopened an initiative begun 10 years earlier with the passing of the underlying Law Act 2000. That in turn had been in response to an aspiration of the, fa of the fathers of Papua New Guinea's founding constitution. In colonial times, English common law had been the principal source of judicial reasoning. Indigenous customs were recognized as, as simply as a point of fact, um, evidence to inform judgment, but they themselves weren't points of law. The founders of the constitution envisaged a future where custom would itself be regarded as a source of the underlying law. It was 25 years, however, before legislation was on the statute books to encourage the official courts to give customary law precedence over common law. And the lapse in time from 1975 to 2000 meant, of course, that the courts had years of established protocols to overcome, and they made very little headway. The further lapse between 2000 and 2010 compelled the Law Reform Commission to open the debate yet again, and there seems very little of particular remark here. The relationship between law and customary law has dogged the imposition of law and its aftermath in many post-colonial countries, and delays occur for many reasons. More positively, one might interpret the reluctance of the courts as the lawyers wanting to look forward from rather than back into the country's traditional past. Indeed, one might ascribe to the lawyer's slowness to move on this issue an evolutionary view of change, in which dragging up tradition, making custom, as it was called, relevant, would have compromised the cosmopolitan horizon of their actual present. 
But at this juncture, ethnography comes in to suggest that the imputation of an evolutionary presentism doesn't account for everything that is going on. I refer to a study of trainee lawyers, aspirants of Papua New Guinea's cosmopolitan elite. They gave the ethnographer in question a very specific impression about their own lack of interest in customary law, more than lack of interest. They tried to avoid the topic. They harboured, she says, a chronic disinclination to think about custom as part of their work. And the cause seems to have been that far from custom being part of a past to be left behind or, alternatively, honoured in its recovery from the past, they had instead a very lively sense of its present effects and contemporary force. The vernacular concept of custom, known misleadingly by an adopted English term for past tra tradition, connotes the way people's distinctive practices are grounded in specific places with an emphasis on their present ongoing salience and openness to innovation. As one lawyer expostulated, it's just how people live. After all, Custom can acquire resonance, above all, custom can acquire resonance as a vehicle for power drawn from that attachment to place, and the law students were not going to meddle in other people's sources of power. And that was the basis, it seems, of their reluctance. If invoking custom is not about conserving past practices for the sake of tradition, no more may we suspect is recourse to the foundational constitution necessarily a backward look. On the contrary, if we read it as an anticipation of an episodic present, it comprises a forward look. Consider again those who were trying to shift the judicial inertia by making appeals to the nation's founders. Are those contemporary lawyers and legal scholars striving to activate the underlying law not returning to the regenerative moment that had led to the present day. That return surely renews the productive differentiation effected at independence in the nation's self-definition vis-a-vis its colonial form. The need to encourage new formulations of the underlying law are more like an effort to separate once more the post-colonial legal system from that of its colonial predecessors. Let's focus on the persons involved. The return is being made by the potential evidence of that action's success, that is, by the present generation. The return is at once a validation of the generative power of their own source of, sources of existence, the cut with colonization that made themselves anew, and holds out the possibility that in recovering the very separation that led to themselves, they too will make Papua New Guinean independence work all over again. For these lawyers then, perhaps that crucial break is also, recorded, is also recalled as looking forward to a moment when the past in the form of customary law might finally come into its own. For they already embody, live again, their ancestors' vitality of which they are the evident outcome, seeking to regenerate that with their own next radical innovation. Running together, these colonial and post-colonial reflections from Papua New Guinea, and I do thank you all for your patience in listening to this, is a reminder that for almost as long as ethnography has been on the anthropologist's drawing board, continuity and change have been paired together. It seems of a piece with the way cultures used to be defined in terms of their similarities and dissimilarities. I end with a brief reflection on whether anything is added by asking what might be judged ontologically pertinent in these materials. Are we dealing with a clash of ontologies? The Melanesian materials have at once drawn attention to a divergence between what I'm calling two kinds of present two kinds of focus on change, evolutionary and episodic, and emphasized the convergences in the apparent accord between some of the aspirations of colonizers and colonized. We might conclude that there was a, there was a degree of understanding between them, 
or some kind of mutual intelligibility to their outlooks. Of course, there were innumerable first contact misunderstandings about what the new time indicated, about new wealth institutions and so forth, and there was much frustration and disappointment. Yet it seems that there was enough in the way each party appeared to the other for misunderstandings to be accommodated within what people agreed about. That said, the very similarity in the aspirations that seemingly drove Australians and Highlanders alike could also be telling us something else. Perhaps the accord did not have to rest on mutual intelligibility of outlook. Perhaps there may indeed have been a clash, deeply and radically so, but it didn't show itself. Arguably, what differentiates an ontological clash I'm sorry, I get into a string of assertions here. You must uh, forgive me. Arguably, what differentiates an ontological clash from a cultural one is that it's not necessarily visible. While anthropologists might often talk about culture as the coherence of an internal logic, culture in a weak sense, to imagine a clash of cultures is to endorse an externalized, inter-ethnic logic invoking culture in a strong sense, and in this latter mode, ontological divergence is not going to look like a cultural clash, and it may not even look like a clash at all. In fact, we don't really require the idea of a clash as overt conflict or ethnic distance in order to talk of divergence between ontologies. Nor for that matter, nor for that matter any argument that ontological outlooks have to be similar in some degree entailing mutual comprehension for there to be communication. To the contrary, I suspect that the relationship of similarity and dissimilarity to the capacity to interact is, frankly, indeterminate. Degree of comprehension, certainly, is not a predictor of the success of an interchange. In other words, to talk of similarity or dissimilarity between ontologies is to treat them as though they were cultures in the strong sense. It seems to me that the concept of ontology is more usefully summoned in the way Melanesians talk of custom. Custom stresses the distinctiveness of each people's place and its ancestral supports, regardless of whether the subject is a particular person or a collective. Each is unique not because it's the only person or collective with ancestors, but because other people's ancestors have nothing to do with oneself, and that is also true of custom. Custom works, we may say, like a gathered field. Everything people see around them can be gathered together in a manner coherent within a specific situation, which relays back to them that this is the way the world is. The field keeps its own scale, as always how things are. At any one point, everything conspires to produce this gathering together. And with the broad brush used here, if time flows in an evolutionary manner, apropos the sequencing of change and processes of growth, certain moments reinforce that evolutionary disposition. If people's actions in relation to one another give change an episodic quality, the same moments reinforce an episodic one. In other words, the specificity or distinctiveness of each is a property of these fields, and it's that, not the comparison of one with the other, which makes them quite apart from the similarities and dissimilarities that an observer sees. It follows, I think, that anthropologists might allow themselves to designate similarities and dissimilarities between ontological scenarios without imputing to those scenarios the idea that any such determination affects how they work. For the actors, seemingly similar events can nonetheless be gathered together into quite distinctive fields. Equally, each may gather up things strange and bizarrely different from another's perspective, so much so they can stand out at contrasts. But it's not that difference which specifies its ontological import. That import lies in the echo chamber effect by which the world plays back to people what they apprehend about it through the evidence it offers their ideas. 
my last paragraph. One of the pleasures of returning to earlier work is to discover situations that may speak to current theoretical preoccupations in an altogether different language. Thinking of the Keller villagers at that moment in the early 1990s, with the predicaments of an abrupt transition and their future imaginings, has made me go back to old ethnographic material of my own. And those predicaments have possibly offered some kind of comment on recent debate on culture and ontology. But I'm not so sure that these debates add a great deal to what Daphne Badal so skillfully wrote about in other terms. Thank you. is happy to take questions. Um, we do have a microphone um, <coughs> for questions. There it is. So if you can raise your hand if you have a question. And she's also quite happy if there aren't any. <laughs> and she's happy if there aren't any. And there's a reception afterwards. So. <laughs> there's no need. <laughs> Um, do you think um, at this stage the lights could be turned off? Because I, I actually can, cannot... Yeah. Can we turn the lights down see. now? Thank you. Oh, that's wonderful. That's oh, great. I can oh, see you. Hello. much better. <laughs> I really haven't been able to see you at all. Does time have a moral uh, dimension to it, uh, which I, I think it clearly does, but which it, it was somehow, um, I don't know, missing from, from, your, uh, you know, from your discussion? Um, clearly, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the West, the future is always the, uh, imagined to be um, or at least before the advent of our current president, the future is always imagined to be an improvement, a moral improvement, and the pa over the past, which was uh, somehow less uh, less developed. And I, that's certainly the case in in many, um, particularly those places in PNG which are missionized. Well, all places in PNG are missionized, uh, but which. You know, I couldn't quite hear how that fit into your, um, mm -hmm. uh, to your discourse. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> yes, thank, thank you for that. Um, uh, you're quite right. That wasn't something that I emphasized at all, um, except, of course, in the uh, people inhabiting an evolutionary present take that for granted because that is already... It is already contained in the in, in the, the the concept of time's forward flow. Um, uh, I, I I would I would be a little more equivocal, I think, uh, about whether there was an automatic assignation of what was more or less desirable between different epochs in in the past. Um, as I as I as I understand at least some of the Papua New Guinean mythology. Uh, the question is that certain inventions occur without which present life couldn't be contemplated, like the invention of marriage I mentioned or the invention of exogamy or the invention of fire or whatever. And these things are essential for present life and in that sense fundamental to it and that sense obviously people's desirables. But I'm not sure there's necessarily always a backward imputation that, that the time when these things were... Absent. I mean, they were largely a source of humor, or they were they were odd, they were bizarre because they apparently lived without these things. Um, 
but I, I would, you know, you know it's, it's certainly worth pursuing. But, but thank you, for, thank you very much. Yes. Um, and I might just say that I did find your own comments on time very apposite, <laughs> very helpful. The, so this um, accord, if we call that accord, wait, can you hold that closer? Yeah. If that accord is a space, let's say, um, space with many space, space with many sides that allows multiple perspective, let's say, um, how does that space of accord can transition into clash or clash into accord? Um, I, I, yes, I was holding. I was holding two things. Two things separate. Um, I, I. Okay. If you if you think that my my narrative aim uh, was to arrive at a point of describing the divergence between what I call these two presentisms, which of course w w coexisted in the the cosmopolitan lawyers were manipulating both. I mean. Yeah. Um, then what needs to be then what needs then of, often our our, our um, uh, uh, models of things that are separate or diverged in, uh, implies a notion of difference or dissimilarity. And I'm pointing to an arena where there seem to be, and I'm 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 incredibly over, overstating it because there are all kinds of things going on, but there seem to be uh, some similarity of agreement or accord between what people were doing. And I was using that to suggest that, in fact, difference and similarity is a distraction, that 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 that, that kind of, of of comparison will give you cultural difference and 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 and, and so on and so forth. But um, the, the, there are other kinds of divergences, and I sort of half suggested that um, one might think of them as ont ontological, that, that carry on. Um, I mean, if you think of us, you think of us in terms of our personal ontologies, um, carry on regardless of whether we think we're doing similar or different things from other people. But we've been caught up on this dynamic of similarity and difference for so long. It's the only way we appear to be able to think through. But I think that is cultural thinking. For, for which I still have a lot of use. I mean, I'm just happen to be quoting these people. I asked that question because it seems to me that in order for us to allow something like historicity... Sorry? Historicity. In order I, to I, allow historicity. I did historicity. understand the, the analytical distinction that you're making um, between accord and clash very clearly, but I wonder if, in order for us to talk about something like historicity, we have to focus precisely on how accord transitions into clash and clash transitions into accord. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, if, yes if, if one were interested in historicity, I, I would agree, um, indeed. Yes. Yeah. Um, I want to draw a rough parallel, but it may not be very much of a parallel, between um, what you're saying about episodic and evolutionary sorts of temporalities. And if you think about economy, uh, in which um, it was Joseph Schumpeter who introduced the notion of, or I should say innovated, innovated the notion of innovation, which was a radical change from what went before, and the argument gets quite complicated and how that produces a surplus and so forth. So you have on the one hand the notion of economy, think of your yams, that continue in a kind of linear way mm -hmm. with some small changes, and then you have a notion of someone develops, I don't know, a new way of raising yams, a new yam supply, a different crop, something like that, which would be episodic. And the contradiction or the tension that I still think about in terms of economy is that most economists 
Well, the talk about growth of the economy it usually means population is expanding, production systems are expanding, but it's the innovation, and we've lived through this obviously technologically in the last 25 years, that make the episodic kinds of ones. So there's always that tension between the two going back mm -hmm, and forth. Mm -hmm. Now, in fact, in his later writings, uh, Schumpeter turned this to the political sphere, which would be closer to what you're talking about as opposed to just economy. So I'm wondering whether these things are actually, I don't want to say built in, but they're part of, I'll use the word, they're part of culture. That's what cultures are all about between these two different ways. And we're living in a system, a time, obviously now, very rapid change. And you could talk about some of the political nostalgia and so forth that's going on. I won't push it that far. But I'm wondering whether you might agree that there's a kind of parallel there. And this has been very well kind of examined or not so well examined. How The question is, how does that creativity of the innovation come about? And that I don't think we know. In your case, there is the outside, the colonial force, which is producing some of this. Um, others might claim it's endemic to capitalism. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for that. Um, that allows me to explain that although, of course, I was talking about time, I was in no way entering into the vast discussions that the, the, the have been on time and the particular, uh, the, the, the particular uh, point you're making um, uh, is, 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 is very well taken. I was, in a sense, trying to sideline the very notion of time by focusing on uh, practices of change and talking about ideas of the present and making the notion of time's flow characteristic of one regime and not another. It was just a, it was a narrative. It was a, way, it, was a way, it was a way of doing it. Uh, but the point, the point about um, uh, innovation and, of course, and, and how innovations um, arise uh, is very interesting because I think it's, it's a, a constant puzzle um, uh, precisely for people for whom time flows in an evolutionary way that there are innovations. And, we're, and this is something that we're constantly trying to explain because these, these are the ex apparently exceptional moments. Um, I think in the sort of, I've got myself into a binary, but never mind. I, I think in the episodic uh, mode, um, th there is uh, there is nothing um, uh, uh, to be explained about innovation at all, because that that happens uh, with the um, uh, through the through the life and death sequence of. Of, of the generations as replace one another, and that is that is um, uh, uh, epitomised in the very routine way in which vegetative reproduction uh, simply requires um, the, the 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 cutting of the piece that will be the future parent that is that is then pushed into the ground and then of course be, be becomes uh, the generative source of the next of the next generation. And that that that, that uh, power, the, the, the regenerative power, uh, happens all the time, routinely, and it can happen. At, it can happen at as, as it were, at any scale. There's nothing to be explained there about the appearance of the new generation. So, so I think what's very interesting in your comment is that you've pinpointed uh, uh, a. a um, perplexity that we have about innovation that precisely comes from, a, from rather different ways of, of dealing with uh, time's flow, as I've referred to. <laughs> we can continue. <laughs> <coughs> Professor Strathern can catch her breath and get something to drink, and we will um, head out to the reception. Thank you. Right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.